Hi, this is Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Tuesday, June, uh, January 28th, 2013. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. L let me first again start off by saying uh, bit my tongue a couple of days ago and it's uh, swollen up, a little painful, hard to talk, so please bear with me uh, if that's the case. Anyway, let's have a look at a few things going on today. I want to talk more about some of the things that kind of show where we are and some some biblical proof of who we are and the fact that God's Word is truth. This first story comes out of Fox News. Now I know um, Fox doesn't always get it right. They're part of that lamestream media most of the time. But I've seen this story in other places. However, Fox's writers tend to hit it a little bit better. It says, message decoded again. 3,000-year-old text may prove biblical tale of King Solomon. I love when a large mainstream or lamestream media, as I call them, do something to help prove biblical truth. This says a few characters scratched into the side of an ancient earthenware jug have archaeologists scrambling for their dictionaries and wondering if it corroborates the biblical story of King Solomon. This 3,000-year-old inscription found in Israel in July is the earliest alphabetical write, written text ever found in Jerusalem. It proves the real basis behind the parables and stories in the world's most famous book, the Holy Bible, said Gershon Galil, a professor of ancient history and biblical studies at the University of Haifa. He said, we're dealing here with real kings and the kingdom of David and Solomon was a real fact. Galil told FoxNews.com in a phone call from Israel. King David and King Solomon were a real fact. I just hope when stories like this break that people will say, well, gosh, if that story was true and it was in the Bible... Maybe there's other true stories in the Bible. Let me just go ahead and tell you right now, the entire Bible is true. It's the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, everything in between is completely true, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, written down by men, some 40 authors, spanning a time frame of about 1,500 years, all pointing to the same truths. The Old Testament speaks of the coming Messiah and gives over 300 prophecies of His coming, the New Testament introduces you to him. His name is Yeshua, or Jesus in the English. The Son of God, God in flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Christ, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. One who died on the cross to save you from hell, to save you from your sins, to save you from yourself and the devil and this world. That one. I love when archaeology and science help prove the Word of God. You know, Jesus said in, in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Thy Word is truth. Jesus also explained to us that we would know the truth, and the truth would set us free. And he let us know that, in fact, he was that truth that sets us free. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. People, that clearly says, Jesus, who lived a life without sin, he was perfect in every way. Couldn't lie, couldn't sin, said he was the only way to God the Father. That means Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father. Any other way is basically the broad road to destruction. So if you're trying to get to God following after religions of man, if you're trying to get to God following after some false doctrine, some false cult, some false religion that does not include the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, you will not get to heaven. It's only trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior repenting of your sins, asking him to forgive you, and believing that he is who he said he is. That's the only way to God the Father. 
I love seeing stories like this that help confirm biblical truths. Love seeing that. Um, let's go to Israel out of frontpagemag.com. Abbas says no to Israel as a Jewish state. Well, big shock there. You know, there's so many sticking points in this Middle East peace process. The Palestinians will not recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Forget that there's 57 Muslim countries already. They can't even recognize one little tiny Jewish state. Um, Palestinians will not accept any peace agreement that does not include Jerusalem as their capital. The Jews in Israel will not accept dividing Jerusalem. They will not accept a peace agreement where the Palestinians do not agree to recognize Israel as the Jewish state. There's several sticking points that neither side is willing to give in on. When two sides can't come to an agreement, it usually leads to fighting, which I think we'll probably see and it would most likely be the Psalm 83 war spoken of, where they say, come, let us make sure the name of Israel is remembered no more. And all those groups mentioned in Psalm 83 are called enemies of God. And if you do a little research, you'll see that each and every one of those groups and nations mentioned is today Muslim by nature. And you might think, well, how is it that they're enemies of God? It's pretty simple. Muslims deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They say, oh, no, 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 he's not the Son of God. He's simply a man born of Mary. And they actually claim Jesus is a prophet of Islam, which couldn't be further from the truth. Because in Islam, Allah, their God they pray to, which is not the same God as the Christian or Jewish God, they claim he has no son, no heir. Okay? They think lining up a son with a god is hypocrisy. They think it's, uh, it's, it's dishonoring that god to say he has a son. So denying Jesus as the son of God is an antichrist spirit. The Bible's pretty clear on that. They deny he died on the cross. They deny he rose again from the dead. They deny the three very basic tenets of the Christian faith, thereby denying Christ himself and the Father who sent him, according to the Holy Bible. So, that would make them enemies of God. Um, so, this whole meeting in Davos, Switzerland, this World Economic Forum, Benjamin Netanyahu once again stated the Jewish state theme, saying, you know, they have to recognize us as the Jewish state. And, of course, Abbas is saying, uh, nope, no way, no how. But it's interesting because uh, on Israeli TV, Justice Minister Zippy Livni, who is a, a dove, kind of, you know, um, very... They've got the hawkish side and the dove side. You know, the hawks are ready to fight and you know, proclaim this is ours and we're not changing this. And the doves are kind of more meek and mild and uh, outspoken. But she said, uh, she's also the Israeli chief negotiator in these Israeli-Palestinian talks. But she made a statement, says, If the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas considers to insist on positions that we and the rest of the world consider unacceptable, the Palestinians will be the ones who pay the price. That's a pretty hardcore statement coming from Zippy Livni. Um, she's willing to give away all kinds of Israeli land for peace. I hope she doesn't come into power. You know, there was a time where they thought she might become the next prime minister. And if that were the case, she'd give away all kinds of land. Um, which would not bring peace, sad to say. But Abbas, quite plainly, again said, Palestine can never recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Never. Never. Netanyahu has said, we'll never divide Jerusalem, ever. It's our undivided, eternal capital of the Jewish people. And the Palestinians are saying, we want 
a new land with Jerusalem as our capital, a shared capital. They want East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount, the holiest place to the Jews. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Here we are, people. It's a sign of the times we're living in. Here's something out of South Milwaukee Now. Uh, it says, scientists have developed a human-powered battery for RFID implantable chips. This technology is becoming very high-tech. And what basically happens, this process they use is what's known as conformal piezoelectric energy harvesting and storage from motions of the heart, lung, and diaphragm. So they're using the body <clears throat> as a battery power source for these implantable RFID chips. Now, <clears throat> I've been one ever since we've learned what RFID chips are several years ago, uh, probably nearly 10 years ago now. I've been one to think that that is probably the device that will be used as the mark of the beast. Because there's never been a time in human history that you could track and monitor every single person on the face of the earth until now with the invention of the internet and with the invention of this RFID chip. I think we're that much closer to seeing this happen. Here's, here's something out of End of the American Dream. I didn't see this, but here's a story talking about it. It says, Katy Perry. Illuminati priestess conducts witchcraft ceremony in front of the entire world. It says, did you see Katy Perry's performance at the Grammys? It was an Illuminati themed occult ritual. <clears throat> wow, that's, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore, it sounds like, doesn't it? Uh, she dressed up as a witch and her performance included a Knights Templar cross emblazoned across her chest a beast with Moloch horns, dancers in dark robes with devil horns protruding from their heads, and pole dancing with a broom. At the end of the ceremony, Perry was burned at the stake as the song ended. All of this hardcore occult symbolism did not get into her performance by accident, the story says. The attention to detail that this performance exhibited shows that someone put a lot of thought and effort into it. So was Perry actually kidding when she said that she had sold her soul to the devil during a television interview a few years ago? The kind of stuff that Perry is doing now is not for amateurs. She is either working with someone who's deep into the occult, or she is deep into it herself. And of course, the elite absolutely love this stuff. Even if you don't believe in occult rituals or Illuminati symbolism, it's very important to remember that the elite do. In fact, many of them are completely obsessed with this stuff. And they're more than happy to promote any performer that embraces their world. This is the world we live in, people. The devil is hard at work. Our enemy is hard at work. He knows his days are numbered. You know, the devil knows scripture. He knows what the Bible says about him. He's trying to do all he can to fight against it. But I believe in his heart he knows his days are numbered. He knows. That's why he is unleashing all hell on earth right now to try to lead us all away from the truth of the cross of Christ. Here's another story. <clears throat> Out of the blaze. Uh, says real life demon possession is being reported in Indiana. The details are almost too horrifying to believe. This terrified mother claims she watched in horror as her demon possessed nine year old son walked backwards up a wall and ceiling. Her claims would be easy to dismiss if a child services caseworker and a nurse weren't reportedly there to witness it also. This story goes on to say all kinds of things. Their, their kids are being demon-possessed, including evil, evil smiles and strangely deep voices. Mother says she also witnessed her 12-year-old daughter levitating in their Gary, Indiana home. People tend to dismiss demons, saying, ah, pff, that was just something they did in the old days. Let me tell you something. Demon possession is real. It's all around us. People just don't realize it. I don't think they recognize it. But it's out there. It's all around us. There's a lot of people who are possessed by demons, some more subtle than others. 
but it's very real. I mean, Christ um, exercised demons out of several people in the Holy Bible. They do exist. They're completely real. You need to watch out for them. Here we are in the week leading up to the Super Bowl. Of course, my team's not in it again. Um, but it's interesting to see the stories coming out on some of the players. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Seahawks quarterback, uh, Russell Wilson, dedicated Christian athlete. Also, Peyton Manning. I've, I've always admired him. I've wished he would come to my team to be the quarterback. <laughs> of course, I'm a devoted Cowboys fan. Have been all my life. Um, Manning, though, they've been talking about him a little bit this week. You, you know, you, you've probably seen some of his funny commercials. Uh, if you ever saw him on Saturday Night Live, he's hilarious and, and quite good. Um, but he's been a committed Christian for more than two decades. Peyton talks about the story in his book, Manning, which he co-authored with his dad, Archie. Uh, talks about his conversion. He says, my faith has been number one since I was 13 years old and heard from the pulpit on a Sunday morning in New Orleans a simple question. If you died today, are you 100% sure you would go to heaven? I think every one of us should honestly and heartfelt answer that question ourselves. Um, he said it was a big church and I felt very small, but my heart was pounding. He said the minister invited those who would like that assurance through Jesus Christ to raise their hands. So I did. Then he invited us to come forward to take his stand and my heart really started pounding. And from where we sat, it looked like a mile to the front, but I got up and I did it and I committed my life to Christ. And that faith has been most important to me ever since. Peyton says his four priorities in order are faith, family, friends, and football. <clears throat> There's a man with a good head on his shoulders. He said, my faith doesn't make me perfect. It makes me forgiven. <laughs> I love it. I wish the whole world would hear his story this week as it leads us up to the Super Bowl. Um, he said he doesn't pray to win games. He says, I pray to keep both teams injury free and personally that I use whatever talent I have to the best of my ability. And he's made this character commitment. He said, dad says it can take 20 years to make your reputation and five minutes to ruin it. I want my reputation to be able to make it through whatever five minute crisis I run into. I'm a lot more comfortable knowing where my help is. Hmm. Dwight Moody said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do the little things. Mm. So what will you do for Jesus today? If you were to die today, are you absolutely 100% sure you know you'd go to heaven? That assurance lies at the foot of the cross. Um... <clears throat> Here we are approaching the end of January, and uh, I always find it funny at the gym. I've been a gym rat since I was 12 years old. Uh, it, it's kind of a lifestyle for me. I've, I've always been athletic. I've always been very active. You know, I, I love to go mountain biking, uh, snow skiing, hiking, camping, all, all kinds of outdoor fun activities, uh, basketball, working out, whatever. But you always see beginning of January, the gym starts filling up with people, you know, making their New Year's resolution. They've resolved to be in shape and healthier and a, a better lifestyle. Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, all these New Year's resolution, you know, typically the enthusiasm of those uh, resolutions lasts about four to six weeks. You always see it taper off in the gym. About now, through the middle of February, um, things get back to normal. Those people decide to give up on those resolutions because they are harder to keep than they thought. You know, they were so excited January 1st. Yeah, here we go. New year, new me. And gosh, this is hard work. <laughs> um, I think as Christians, though, people tend to lose their motivation as well. You know, they've 
they've had enough with their old lives and, and hanging on to all the hurts and the pains from the past and all their habits they're trying to get over. So they decide, you know, this is the year I'm going to really pursue Christ. I'm going to really open my Bible. I'm going to read it. I'm going to do this, do that. And then just like these people at the gym, just four to six weeks later, they find themselves in the same old patterns that they were in before, back to their old ways. So if you're seeking a new start where you can find a divine motivation that you need to really take your walk with Christ to the next level, there's, there's, there's no magic pill you can take. There's no, I don't think there's some kind of ritual you can perform or anything else that you can do other than simply staying committed to what's important. Persistence, perseverance, is nothing more than starting again every day. Determined, today's a new day. That's the way we should see it. You know, wake up every morning with the thought, first of all, thank you, God, for letting me have this day, our daily bread. Um, so don't feel discouraged if you try to start something new and you've failed yet again. Every day's a new day, so treat it like that. Every day is a new chance to make today better than yesterday. Don't be discouraged by your past failures, your shortcomings. Start new every day. Instead of thinking, oh, I have to wait every year to start new. No, every sunrise is a new day and a new chance to commit your life to Christ, to do something for his kingdom, to bring him glory. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Uh, let me confirm that. Uh, I'm not sure which version I took that from. Let me look in the King James, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 11. Uh, no, um, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1, or 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Um, you know, Israel and Judah had this history that points about a truth that's, that's taught clearly enough by all of history, that these masses are, or soon will be, what their leaders are. You know, the king set the moral pace for the people, which, if this is still true today, God help us in America if we all start to think the way our president thinks. Because I don't care what he says, I believe America to still be a Christian nation, when over 76% of the population of America claim to be Christian, and whether they are or not is not for me to judge. That's for God to judge, not me. But if they claim it, I, I will take them for their word, unless Spirit tells me otherwise. But I, I think maybe it's not a good thing for the masses to be so easily led, especially when they're led away from the truth of Christ. But we, we have to look for ways to be more concerned with the truth because the truth is that we should follow after Christ and not after kings or presidents. We shouldn't let them change us into something we're not. We shouldn't let them be the ones who influence us. We should let the Holy Spirit influence us. We should let Jesus Christ influence us, the Holy Bible. You know, a good man might change the moral complexion of a whole nation, or a corrupt and worldly leader might lead a nation into bondage. We've seen this in the Bible. Christianity in the Western world today is what its leaders were in the recent past but it's becoming what its present leaders are. You know, we're seeing more and more people call good evil and evil good. Um, I think that's a really heavy responsibility for any leader to bear, but it's one that they have to carry. So maybe in the next election, we should look deeper into the candidate's beliefs and see if we can't change this country for the better. Because I don't know about you guys, 
that I'm just about fed up with somebody telling us we're no longer a Christian nation. I'm fed up with a president who mocks the Holy Bible, the Word of God. I'm fed up with a president who surrounds himself with Muslim Brotherhood members. I'm fed up with a president who takes these lavish vacations and tells us we need to cut out our lavish lifestyle. I'm fed up with the hypocrisy. I'm fed up with the wrong lifestyle. I'm fed up with the lies. So we need to make sure that we're strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that we might be better leaders ourselves. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 through 8 talks about declaring God's wisdom, you know, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it because they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Have you ever noticed how Satan has used some of the same tricks over and over throughout the Bible history, even today? Uh, in the Old Testament, it seems like his attacks were aimed at preventing the birth of the Christ, the Messiah. But then after Jesus was born, his attacks changed a little bit. He had to have a new motive of operation. Um, in some instances, he tried to kill Jesus before Christ could get to the cross. Other times, he, he tried to attempt to discredit him or cause him to stumble or tempt him with various things. But... Satan met defeat at the cross. I don't think he fully understood God's strategy. <laughs> and Jesus, even though he was innocent, was condemned to die. Satan at first was very happy. He's like, yeah, finally, killing the Son of God. This, this will put an end to all of this nonsense. Well, no, it glorified him even more. The Apostle Paul noted that Satan didn't understand this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. Um, let's read that passage. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. It says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I think even since then, Satan's had to change his tactics a little bit. You know, he's, he's still concerned about preventing the word of God from going forth, the word that was with God and the word that is God, John 1.1. 1, 1. He wants to keep that from reaching people who are under Satan's dominion. You know, his attack now is probably two-pronged. First, he wants to concentrate on the life in the name of Jesus, okay, which each and every believer, all of us, have Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're, his, we're Christ's ambassadors here on earth. We're his his representatives. I think it's important for Christians to understand that when you're persecuted for the name of Christ, to realize that the attack you're under is not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is in you. Okay, don't take it so personal. It's not that they're hating you, they're hating the Christ in you. And I think when you understand this attack, it helps you take it that much better. Um, <laughs> And the devil will make every effort to discredit you, to, to scare you, to shut you up so that you're not effective in spreading the good news of the gospel of Christ. I think sometimes the devil goes too far, like he did at the cross. He, he might even send a believer to a martyr's grave, but that the life lives on in other believers who continue to bear witness even stronger and more triumphantly than ever before. You know, the church not only survives, but it tends to grow stronger under persecution. Um, so the more persecution we're under, the stronger we become because we know who it is we trust. We know who it is we lean on. Mm. How's your witness today? Uh, how are we doing on time? Um, Forgive me, I'm a little pressed for time today. <laughs> um, that's why I'm doing this so early. My schedule is so erratic. I can never plan a specific time of day to do each and every one of these uh, messages. Let's go to Acts 5, verses 29 through 32. And that says, Then Peter 
And the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged upon a tree, and hath raised God, and hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The word obedience can be defined as compliance to the plan, conformity to the pattern, observance of the rules, adherence to the standard, and submission to another's will. Okay? Obedience is what we're called to in the Christian life. It's part of our service. Um, every decision we make is, is necessary of knowing what Scripture says about the issue, you know, what action God wants us to take, what attitude that would please God, and, and what steps are required on our part. To obey means that we're doing what God says in, in the way in which he wants us to do it. We have to then know what his instructions are. We can't comply with something if we don't understand it, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit assists us in this. You know, he, he helps us in relating to God's commands in our life, and he helps us determine the wisest course of action to take in whatever it is you ask, whatever you pray. And then once we decide to obey, we can expect a challenge from the enemy. He might try to distract us from living a godly life, or, or maybe he'll send temptations to us to, to gradually weaken us through some little steps of disobedience. Um, and even though he wants us to compromise, we can counter by resolving to renew our strength to obey the Father just like Jesus did. You know, commitment like the kind that Jesus had requires knowledge of Scripture. Matthew 4, 1 through 10. We, we have to be obedient in our actions. We have to be determined and willing to suffer any consequences that might come from obeying God. You know, when Christ said, it is written, as he responded to the enemy's temptations, that should be our defense too, but unless you know what is written and where it's written, how can you use that as your defense? The best way is to get into the Word. Read it daily. Open your Bibles. Um, <clears throat> you know, whenever you are tempted to disobey the Lord, our faithfulness and our devotion to Christ are at stake. We have to obey. We've got to be humble, obedient servants. That's what we're created for. So ask yourself, is your understanding of the Word of God increasing? Are you becoming more knowledgeable of the Word of God? Are you able to hold God's plan without compromise? Are you willing to obey no matter what? 2 Chronicles 28.10 says, But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? You know, you want to tell a sinner... He deserves the wrath of hell. Make him feel it's an awful thing to fall into the hands of God because he's a consuming fire. Okay? Throw him down on a bed of spikes. Make him sleep there. Step on him a little bit. Roll him around on the spikes. Tell him that as bad as it is, it, he's worse by nature than by practice. Make him feel that every disease lies within him. Give him no rest. Treat him as cruelly as he could treat another one. That would be his just desserts. Who am I telling you to treat like this? No one else but yourself. We have to be harder on ourselves than we are on anyone else. Um, we need to be as severe as we can and judge ourselves more harshly than we could ever judge anyone else. Because in the end, we're the ones that need to change first. Um, we're not judge, we're not jury. Someone has the job of judge, and it's not us. Um, 
we need to make sure that we can be as severe on ourselves as we possibly can. Even putting ourselves under a death sentence. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners deserving of death because of it. And once you come to that place, I think then you're able to find the hope that is in Jesus Christ. The hope that Christ paid that debt already for us. That should have been us hanging on the cross for our sins. But it was Christ hanging on the cross for our sins. Somebody loved you so much, he was willing to die to save you. So many people miss this. Look to cross. Look at Christ hanging on that cross. Every sin you've ever had, every one you will have, was hanging there with him. Does your heart condemn you before God? You know, Jesus is our defense. And if you trust him as Lord, Savior, and King, then he can silence even the condemnation coming from your own heart. You need to trust him. We need to be a witness, not a judge. John 16, 8, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reprove sin. To reprove righteousness and judgment. It's not our ministry. We're, we're simply witnesses. A witness isn't the judge or the jury. A witness simply relates what he's experienced, uh, providing evidence to the truth of something. <clears throat> you know, we're to witness in word and deed to the truth of Jesus being alive in us and let God be the one who convicts. We're not the ones to convict. We're simply to testify what we have seen or what's happened to us. Some people in, in their zealous nature take it a little too far. They've gone beyond the stage of being a witness for Christ and they've tried to bring people under conviction themselves. That's not our job. <clears throat> That's assuming the job that belong, belongs to the Holy Spirit only. We can't have that job. We're not qualified. We're not capable. This not only frustrates the witness, but it drives a lot of people away from the truth of God's word. You know, we make a very poor Holy Spirit. So we should stick to our job of being a witness and let the Holy Spirit do his job. Okay, the Holy Spirit's the one who convicts people of their sins. Jesus specified a, an orderly progression in the way that we should witness. First, we start where we are in Jerusalem as he said, and then we go to those nearby, Judea, how he explained it to those he was talking to, and then we take the gospel to every religious group, every people throughout the whole world. And I think there's some very practical reasons for witnessing like this. Jesus testified that a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown, among his own family and friends. Typically, the hardest place to witness is at home. <laughs> starting with those who know us best will cause us to, to, to humble ourselves and to give God all the glory. It's not about us. The best five minutes I've ever, ever lived on earth would not be good enough to get me into the kingdom of heaven. Also, when, when rejection comes, this, this helps to strengthen us and, and temper our witness so that we become more effective and more resilient when we go out to other parts of the world to witness for Christ? Are you doing your part? Are you doing all that you can for the kingdom and the glory of God? I hope you are. If not, it's time to step it up. God bless you guys. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.